disability, my train of thought, um, just pretty much how how I'm wired. And I, I'm tired of having to explain myself and apologize. Um, I'm I'm one. I walk away, and I'm I'm tired of walking away because the only one that suffers is me and my family. And I, I try, I, I've tried picking up pieces many, many times, trying to fix things. And ultimately, it had to start with me. And I, I got all those answers. And it's, it's crazy, and I'll touch on it for a second here, but five months ago, just so happened to be on my 33rd birthday. I I was fighting for my life. Went to the ER, throwing up blood, throwing up stomach ball. You know, won't get too far. It was it was bad. Uh, went into the ER and it was packed because of everything going on. So I had to sit in the waiting room and it got to the point where I. I had to be wheeled to the bathroom just because I wanted my privacy and ended up throwing up blood again all over the bathroom. Girlfriend front finally got somebody and they took me back, you know, trying, trying to keep this short, but got in the back and they ran some tests, this, that, and the other, and this ain't the first time I've been to the ER for this reason, especially over the past three years since I decided to get clean. You know, I've I've battled demons for years, and it all it all peaked its head, and um, they wanted to send me home again that day, and something in me told them, no, I I cannot this I cannot deal with this no more, and they had another doctor look at it short time later, but he asked me if I wanted to be admitted, you know, since I was refusing to go home, and I'm like, yeah, I want I want answers finally, and. They ended up looking at um, x-rays, MRIs, all that good stuff, and they seen my hernia mesh that I had from surgeries before um, was actually scraping my intestine um, and my stomach lining. So they scheduled surgery um, for the 8th of July, and before surgery, I told, told the anesthesiologist um, that I suffer from PTSD uh, and during my gallbladder surgery down in Arkansas um, I actually woke up on the operating table they say it was because they forgot to give me another shot because the surgery before mine went longer than expected this that and the other but ultimately yes I woke up on the operating table looking at doctors above me with my stomach open and I just screamed like a little girl you know and obviously I was put back under probably 30 seconds but still it's it's that mental mental image mental thought you know and when they when they put me under he told me that they were going to use a new technology that went around my head to monitor my brain waves um and ensure that I would stay sedated, this, that, and the other. Um, and he would let my nurses know that that's what he was doing um, because the wake up was kind of tough for some people um, for whatever reason, I don't know. But when I ended up waking up, I freaked out. I thought I was in a morgue, you know, just my train of thought. That's my instant thought was morgue. You know, nobody around me, obviously, because COVID can't have people close by, you know. And all of a sudden, the nurse came over, and uh, she starts typing in the computer, you know, to get meds, whatever. Um, and asking me to calm down, and, you know. And I just, I, I obviously, I'm not in control. I, I was sedated, just waking up, didn't know what was going on. Um, and the next words I hear was, uh, we have a problem. Another nurse came over. Long story short, I was discharged, accidentally discharged from the hospital before even waking up from surgery. 
I ended up obviously already in a fit of rage, you know, thinking I'm in a morgue, all this stuff. They can't get me any type of meds to help me calm down, nothing of that sort. <clears throat> so they had to send off messages to the doctor, get clearance, all this good stuff, and I'm in a fit of rage. I've I've told people and I'm tired of people not listening to mental health. It's it's I don't have a switch. I can't shut it off. I can't control it. I I've learned to live with it and adapt with it in my own way. You know, and trying to do it the past three years sober has been a journey in itself, you know, but I've kept myself grounded in my family, and that's where it all comes down to. I had I had to build my family and be proud of who I was. Well, I ended up getting up, walking out of surgery within an hour and a half after surgery. They couldn't get me meds. I just wanted to get out of there and get some type of relief. They gave me uh, meds to go home with. When I stood up, though, everything dropped, and... So it be whatever I I've, I've got to swallow the pill, you know. But ultimately, I had to go through two other surgeries after that, and I have to swallow the pill of losing half my manhood because doctors wouldn't listen. I've especially the past three four days, I get a shock in that region, and it's. It's a pain I can't I can't even describe. It'll bring a grown man to his knees. Yet I still get up and I'm trying. I've I've been to three different jobs in the past well two months because I was on bed rest for two and a half, almost three months I was on bed rest because of that whole ordeal. You know, and what I what I didn't mention is when they did that go to fix the hernia mesh, excuse me, um, they found a stump of my appendix in my stomach, you know, and it, it summed up everything, all my problems I've gone through through the years of doctors saying it, you know, stomach ulcers or this, that, and the other, you know, ultimately, a piece of my appendix was left inside from surgery back in 07. And that I had to deal with that. I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't I didn't know how to put the words into context. Obviously, I'm going through the pain, I'm going through the signs, I'm throwing up all this and doctors all oh, stomach ulcers. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna beat on that too much because you know that's it's a part of life. I've gotta swallow that pill and it's Yes, I don't think it's right. Nobody should have to go through what I went through for 14 years because doctors wouldn't do their job. And the crazy thing is when my appendix ruptured back in 07, 08, I believe it was, I went two weeks with my appendix ruptured. I went in and the doctors said I had a rare men's bladder infection. And they gave me medicine and went, I went home. 19 years old at the time. Doubled over in pain. I lost 45 pounds in two weeks. Because of that, my appendix, it was ruptured. Surgery for that, they had to leave my stomach open for four days. And drain the gauze. Or drain it. And put gauze in it. And obviously, after this past surgery, they didn't get it all. There was still some left over inside. And I have, I've had to live with that the past 15 years. You know, and it's <clears throat> the repercussion of it, what I have to deal with, what I have to live with, plain and simple. I'm not, the joke, the joke I, I pretty much tell myself to get through it, get over it. I'm only half the man I used to be, you know, and it's, I have to get over it, I've got to live with it, you know, and like I
like I said, mental, and I'm going to try to get to get to the point here, but mental health isn't something you switch, you know, I, I try to help out people I see as much as I can because I know what it's like to be to be at the bottom I know what it's like to struggle so I try to help well I had to start a new job actually it's an old job that I started I went back to because it was close to my house um, because during the surgery process I ended up losing my car so I literally had to start back over and I went because it's only two miles from my house not even two miles probably a mile but anyways I went back there two three weeks ago when I started I was going through the training and I could tell there was a gentleman there that he he was in left field he was he was doing something you know and I I tried to make it known without making it known you know because we're going to drive forklifts you're coming to your first day plain and simple long story short high on heroin you know and I know it for a fact because I everybody in that three and two week span seen them doing it not and out in the break room all that stuff numerous people told management and they they didn't do anything until two thir two Thursdays ago. I nearly hit them in the warehouse. They said they were monitoring him, so he was just full opening boxes, you know, um, emptying them into this tote. Um, not getting on the lift at the time. They because they were monitoring him. They say, but. He was standing in the middle of the aisle when I came around with product, and I glanced over my shoulder, make sure nobody was there. And all of a sudden, I look over my other shoulder, and here he is in the middle of the aisle, staring up at the boxes, just nodding out. And I hit my brakes. I ended up um, having him move. He went off to the side. I dropped the product went immediately to the office and I snapped you know and I yes I didn't handle it the best way but I tried to take my avenues and do what I would my due diligence you know from the first day I was there you know this was a week into it <clears throat> I told them I was just gonna go home for the day and they said that they were gonna do you know they would look into it and go from there. So I went home. Friday, the next morning, Friday morning, I go into work, another shift, and I'm thinking, you know, I I knew he was under the influence. He, I have been, or, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to slow down a minute. <coughs> I have a uh, recording on my phone with me and him in the break room Thursday because I, I knew it was going to come to it. They weren't doing their due diligence. They just wanted another body there because everybody shorthanded this, that, and the other. I get that. But when you're putting people's lives in jeopardy, it shouldn't matter how shorthanded you are or anything like that. Get the guy out of there. Why do we have to wait for something to happen until we do something? You know, like, for instance, yesterday with the shooting in Michigan. That that never should have happened. You're telling me you had meetings with his parents and teachers the day of and the day before. And the parents didn't at least lock the gun up. The, the school didn't at least, you know, look into the kids that were bullying them, have him go, whatever it may have been. Why do we have to wait for something to happen? in order to do something. When I ended up going in Friday, you know, I put my stuff in the locker, you know, I noticed the guy wasn't there, so I figured, hey, you know, they caught him, he's gone, you know, we're good. Well, he ends up walking over the platform, and I was just, are you kidding me? Mind you, this is an hour before his shift. 
because he started at seven because he was still in training. I started at six because they pushed me into loading trucks already because I've been there before. <clears throat> he goes into the break room and immediately it just, how, how can you let this keep happening? How? You can tell the dude had the stuff on his nose. You know, how, how can you not see it happening? The minute he got on his forklift, I lost it on management. He started driving the forklift? No, I am not. I've got a family to go home to. I've got kids to live, look after. I'm not taking the chance of him going to the bathroom, getting the line, and then ODing or nodding out or whatever it may be. You know, I've dealt with drugs firsthand. Obviously, I know what they can do. And that's why I, you never know by calling that dude out in front of him. You know, it may make him realize, you know, he may not even think people notice it. He's just fitting in. He's hiding it. You know, and it's, <clears throat> why do we have to wait for stuff to happen? I ended up leaving that day. They suspended me for three days for leaving a hostile work environment, plain and simple. Ever since then, I've gone back there. I think today was my fourth day I went back. And they said they had the computer system fixed so I can sign in, you know, get, get working because everything's dependent on the computer. Yet again, I'm still inactive in the system because they didn't give me a three-day suspension. They terminated me for walking out of a hostile work environment. Like, we want people to stand their ground, people to speak up on mental health, you know, all this stuff, but yet we let other things fly just because we need an extra body. Well, that extra body can cost you two or three more bodies. But no, let's just wait for that to happen. You know, and then, then we'll do something. But for right now, no. You know, it's... I know I'm probably way, way in over my head doing this. But I'm tired of nobody standing up for what's right. I tried. I've, I've tried. Every day I try to fix myself. I know I'm... I'll never be perfect. I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be better than I was yesterday. And you, you gotta take the little steps. And it's, like I said, the re and it's one of the reasons I've never done anything like this. Because I know there's gonna be people that are gonna bash me, you know, for speaking up, standing my ground. But that's the reason I'm in this predicament. I didn't say something when I should have. And I ultimately watched somebody taking their last steps, taking their last breath, their last words. I was the last person they seen, talked to. I didn't know the gun was waiting for him. But when that gun went off, it changed me. It changed so much from hearing loud bangs to seeing blood. I don't even watch regular TV half the time. If I'm watching something, it's sports. Because that's what I get. That's what, that's what I understand for one. And I'm not going to see somebody getting shot I I can't I can't mentally do it if I'm going to beat this if I'm not going to be a statistic I can't do it alone and that's the problem so many people think everybody just needs to swallow the pill to move on with life not everybody can swallow the pill not everybody can move on with life. There's, there's demons inside everybody. Everybody's battling something you don't see. 
Like I battled all my physical problems for years while battling my mental problems. Yet here I am. And I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to give up. I will always stand my ground. Just because you don't see mental health, you don't see the problem, doesn't mean that person is not going through something. The principle of it, be kind. Treat, at, treat others as you want to be treated. Do what's right. When somebody tells you they can't do something, don't expect them to. Not everybody can do it. And you know, it it, it comes it brings back another issue, you know, at my job. You know, one of the days I went in and the computer didn't work. They wanted me to do a job I wasn't trained on, on a machine I wasn't trained on. They just want me to go do it. I can't. If I mess up and I cost somebody their life or cost me, you know, a limb, I know I shouldn't have done that, plain and simple. So, so I don't do it. You know, and that's... So many years I fought it and the way I gave in was drinking or popping a pill. That's how I'll get through it. That's how I'll shut my head off. That's I'm not going back down that route. But I need help. I can't I can't do it alone. I can't I don't know. I just I guess I need guidance. I need I don't know which way to turn right now. Because I'm literally about to lose everything. My house, my family, I already lost my car. I, I need help. I just, I need to know which way to go. And they say do the footwork. I've been trying. But everywhere I look, there, there's a roadblock. And I I need to find out why. I need to look why. I need 